before the event start and also the event will be uh, in hybrid condition uh, online and also offline so uh, please wait patiently and we will start the event soon thank you very much
silakan mengisi kursi terdepan nggak apa-apa Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Konnichiwa, good afternoon for all the attendees, Professor, Doctor, Doctor, and all my colleagues in this afternoon guest lecture, Maternal Fetal Medicine, Department of Obstetric and Gynecology, FKKMK UGM, on Monday, 12 December 2022 with main topic and underestimated issue around hepatitis B during pregnancy, are we clear enough to solve the problems? Before we proceed, let me introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Reska Khalifa and today I will be your guide during this whole session. And moving on to our first uh, agenda, I will list to you all the uh, session that we will be attending. The first one is the welcoming speech from our health department, Dr. Dr. Arlenu Kusmanto, OBGYN consultant, oncology. And continuing after that is the ILMIA session that will be uh, guided by Dr. Asanuddin Atamimi, OBGYN consultant. Magister of Medical Education and there is three there are three topics that we will be discussing the first one is current topics in hepatitis B virus research it will be presented from for, by Prof Iqbo Soji MD PhD and then upstream prevention of hepatitis B vertical transmission it will be presented by Dr Dr Siti Maisuri Tajudin Khalid OBGYN consultant fetal maternal medicine. The last uh, presentation will be the role of the antioxidant response pathway against hepatitis B virus replication. It will be presented by Dr. Adi Arifianto. After all those topics presented, there will be a 30 minute discussion session and then closing. Without further ado, let's move on to our first agenda. It is singing our national anthem, Indonesia Raya. For all the attendees, please stand up and sing from your deepest heart.
with it. Thank you and moving on to our first session. It is a welcoming speech from our head department, Dr. Dr. Adanu Kusmanto, OBGYN specialist, oncology consultant. Please, you may have the time. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Honorable uh, professors, doctor, OBGYN friends and colleague, colleges. Also my dearest trainees, residents, young doctors, and students, as well as our educational staff, in the Department of OBGYN, FKKMK, UGM. As usual, first of all, the most important thing, let us give our thanks and gratitude to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, who always give His grace and guidance, so that until now we can gather both person here and online to take part in one of our routine uh, scientific event in the department of OBGYN, FKKMK UGM, which is our uh, expert lectures. This is our duty as doctors to always try to add or refresh our skill and knowledge in women reproductive health services. I would like to thank to the speakers, Professor Iko Sochi, MD, PhD, from the Center for Infectious Diseases, Kobe University Graduate School of Medicine, and Dr. Dr. Siti Mausuri Tajuddin Khalid, Specialist of Obstetric Gynecology, Subspecialist Kedokteran Veta Maternal, from Department of OBGYN, Hasanuddin University Hospital Makassar, and the one who makes us proud is one of our staff, Dr. Adi Arifianto from Graduate School of Medicine, Kobe University, who in this event willing to share knowledge with us. And also to my senior, Dr. Asanuddin Atamini, Specialist of Surgery Gynecology, Subspecialist Kedokteran Veto Maternal, Master of Medical Education, who is willing to be the moderator in this event. I also express my gratitude to the participants in this expert lecture, as well as to the organizers who have worked to organize this excellent event. I hope that we can all get the uh, benefit as much as possible. I apologize if there are mistakes. Bibit api, bobotemoto, babaran selamat. Let us always compete in goodness. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Kardanu, for the welcoming speech. Uh, we hope that this guest lecture can be our media to always learn new topic and also sharing uh, between us doctor. Moving on to our main uh, lectures uh, that will be guided or will be led by Dr. Asanuddin Atamimi. Let me read brief history of uh, Dr. Asanuddin. He was born in Kulon Progo on 23rd July 1969. Currently active as the head of KSM Objin uh, Sarjito Hospital and also a lecturer in FKKMK UGM and also RSUP Dr. Sarjito. There is many training and award that has been accomplished by uh, Dr. Asanuddin. Without further ado, Dr. Asanuddin, the place is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon all, the professor, the doctors, also the student 
the residents also uh, OBGY in, in Department of Obstetric and Gynecology uh, Sarjito Hospital in Yogyakarta and we proceed to the like, 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 like. and first is uh, our distinguished guests in the Zoom uh, we are very pleased to to be with you Professor Iko Soji uh, let we introduce you to the audience that is the Professor Iko Soji is a professor of the infectious disease in the medical department of uh, infectious disease in a graduate school of medicine in Kobe University and uh, he is a PhD in internal medicine in Kyoto University University and uh, he is, uh, I think you have been here in Yogyakarta in 2019, Professor Ikuo Soji. Uh, you, give, you give us a lecture in uh, academic hospital that at the time uh, about the hepatitis B infection. And now we invite you to the audience that is a uh, the students of um, medical doctors and also the residents that know uh, in the Department of Obstetric and Gynecology in Gajah Mada University, uh, Sarjita Hospital. It is near the academic uh, hospital that you visited the last time, I think, in the 20, uh, in 2019. And okay, uh, Professor Iko Soji, it is your time for give uh, the lecture. Recording in progress. Okay, <clears throat> okay uh, thank you very much for kind introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to give a lecture in uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, then let me show you the slide. Okay. 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 Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, hepatitis B virus and the current topics. And uh, shown here is the, uh, the uh, old uh, Takeda castle. It's uh, like a, uh, a castle in the sky, uh, which is in uh, Hyogo Prefecture. So when you have a chance to come to uh, Kobe, please visit uh, the place. Okay, so today's topic is, uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of uh, hepatitis B virus, and I would like to introduce our current project, two projects. One is an uh, ongoing project, uh, anti-HBV uh, uh, agents, uh, and we are screening and from the uh, heterocyclic compounds and we identify the one candidate which uh, may be able to uh, inhibit HBV infection. And the second topic is uh, 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 we uh, identify the HBX interacting protein and PRDX1, and uh, we analyze the uh, uh, mechanism, molecular mechanisms uh, of uh, PRDX1 dependent uh, HBV uh, virus uh, replication control. Okay, so as you probably know that the uh, uh, hepatitis B virus uh, cause uh, a chronic hepatitis 
uh, liver cirrhosis and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, WHO estimates that um, uh, about 300 million people are infected with HBV. And uh, uh, in one year, uh, 1.5 million people will get a new infection of HBV. And uh, approximately 1 million people uh, are estimated to die annually uh, worldwide of uh, chronic uh, liver diseases, uh, including liver cirrhosis or a hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, HBV cure uh, is still very difficult uh, because of the persistence of HBV CCC DNA, covalently closed circular DNA. And the uh, and HBV uh, genome integrate into the host genome and causes uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So shown here is the uh, HBV genome, and HBV is a very small uh, DNA virus uh, with the uh, uh, 3.2 kilobases of genome, and it encodes uh, four open reading frame, uh, press one, press two, S, and uh, polymerase, and pre core core, and X gene. And uh, HBB is a uh, 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 incomplete uh, double stranded uh, DNA. And so it means that uh, uh, some parts, are, uh, most of the parts are double stranded, but some parts are uh, single stranded DNA. And uh, uh, HBB uh, has uh, four different uh, open reading frames and uh, express the viral proteins. So HBB uh, particle is uh, just a 42 nanometer uh, in diameter and very small virus. And uh, HBB captured and is covered by uh, uh, HBS antigen, a large envelope, middle envelope, and small envelope. And the uh, large S uh, binds to the uh, uh, receptor uh, uh, in the uh, cells and enter into the cells. So the uh, recent uh, breakthrough in HBV research field is the discovery of uh, HBV uh, functional receptor, sodium tyrocholate co-transporting polypeptide in PCP. So uh, the, this uh, discovery made us uh, to investigate the uh, HBV life cycle in the cell culture system. And uh, this discovery is really huge and uh, changed the HBV research field. And the uh, viral particle uh, uh, binds to uh, NTCP uh, via uh, PRESS1 uh, peptide of the HBV and uh, uh, enter into the cells and the uh, nuclear capsid uh, goes to the uh, nucleus and uh, RC DNA is uh, 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 Transform uh, uh, RC DNA is, is changed to CCC DNA, uh, which is very stable uh, DNA, and uh, uh, this uh, DNA uh, remain in the nucleus and produce the viral uh, mRNAs and the subgenomic RNAs and produce uh, the noble or. Uh, virus released uh, outside the cells, and uh, uh, which is the uh, life cycle of hepatitis B virus. And uh, here, as uh, shown here, is the uh, HPV-related hepatocellular uh, develop carcinoma uh, development. And uh, 
HBV uh, infect to hepatocytes and the HBX uh, uh, gene uh, integrated into the uh, host genome and, uh, and inactivate uh, very important uh, host factors, uh, uh, human tert and, and so on. And uh, HBV uh, infected cells remain in the cells and it causes inflammation and uh, uh, hepatocytes regenerates and uh, fibrosis occurs and the uh, chromosomal instability and epigenetic change occurs to the cells and uh, low-grade dysplasia uh, occurs and uh, high-grade dysplasia and early HCC and advanced HCC. And, uh, uh, but it's still uh, unclear how uh, HBV uh, infection causes hepatocellular carcinoma, but the uh, number of important host genes such as uh, P53 and RB are uh, inactivated uh, by the uh, virus and the uh, uh, HBV uh, infected hepatocytes are uh, transformed to uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, shown here is a uh, most famous study done by uh, uh, Tokyo University. Uh, he uh, made a transgenic mice expressing hepatitis B X gene. And this mice uh, uh, express uh, B X gene in the hepatocyte in the liver of the transgenic mice and the uh, HBX transgenic mice uh, causes uh, apoptosis and uh, finally uh, HCC. And uh, this study uh, clearly uh, indicates that the uh, HBV uh, gene is important for hepatocarcinogenesis. Okay, so I would like to introduce our study and uh, this study is done by uh, our PhD student, uh, uh, Rashi Swarudana. Uh, he's from Udayana University, Indonesia. Uh, he works on a uh, uh, novel bile acid derivative uh, inhibitor uh, for HBV uh, replication and uh, uh, infection via bile uh, 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 HBB receptor, NTCP. Okay, so uh, probably uh, all of you know that the uh, standard HBB treatment uh, is done by uh, nucleoside analog and uh, pegylated interferon. And uh, these uh, treatments are very effective and good therapy. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you can uh, expect uh, uh, a functional cure, but the uh, uh, complete cure is impossible uh, because uh, persistent CCC DNA remains in the hepatocytes. And a uh, number of uh, researchers and the companies are trying to identify a new anti-HBV agents to uh, achieve the complete cure, but it's still uh, unsuccessful. And the HBV uh, binds to the NTCP. And the, uh, Dr. Watashi, NIID, uh, Tokyo, Japan, uh, his group discovered that uh, EGF receptor uh, is also important for the entry of the HBV into the cells. And the NTCP and the EGF receptor uh, interact and uh, in the uh, plasma membrane. And the, uh, uh, by these two uh, host molecules, HBV enter into the cells. And uh, so uh, the, uh, there are many steps uh, for HBV uh, life cycle, and they are people are trying to inhibit uh, entry of the virus into the hepatocytes and uh, RNS 
Uh, RNA interference uh, technology is also applied to uh, new HBV uh, uh, therapy. And the uh, captured uh, inhibitors uh, also uh, uh, developed uh, to uh, achieve the uh, complete cure of HBV infection, but it's still uh, difficult uh, to cure uh, HBV infection. So uh, we uh, collaborate uh, with uh, Kobe Pharmaceutical University's uh, Dr. Ueda's uh, laboratory, and they, uh, we uh, screened uh, macro or uh, we screened uh, heterocyclic compounds to uh, find their anti novel anti HBB compounds uh, using uh, HBB nano reporter virus. Uh, this uh, the, uh, reporter virus is developed by uh, Dr. Uh, Shimotono, uh, uh, National uh, Center uh, NCC uh, in Tokyo. And they, uh, this system uh, uh, enabled us to screen uh, anti-HBV drugs uh, in the high throughput manner. And uh, we add uh, uh, compounds to the hep G2 expressing NTCP HBV uh, receptor. And uh, we uh, inoculate the reporter virus. And uh, we measure the nanoluc uh, luciferase activity to uh, see the inhibitory effect of, of these compounds. And uh, uh, this is a, a cell viability test and uh, uh, to show that uh, these compounds are not uh, toxic to the cells. And uh, we found that uh, uh, several positive uh, compounds, that among them uh, we uh, focused on the research SO145, which inhibits the HBV growth. So to understand the mode of uh, action of SO145, we uh, added a, a compound to the tissue culture system to see the uh, inhibitory effect. And uh, before inoculation or uh, uh, core or inoculation, and uh, after uh, inoculation, we treated the cells with the uh, compounds. And we found that the pretreatment and co-treatment are effective for uh, HBV, but uh, after treatment, uh, it uh, doesn't work. So uh, this result suggests that uh, SO145 inhibits HBV infection at the early uh, phase of the HBV life cycle. Then we uh, 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 examine uh, whether the SO145 has any effect on the uh, viral replication. And we uh, use the HBV uh, replicating cells. Uh, but however, uh, SO145 has no effect on HBV replication. Uh, this uh, indicates that uh, SO145 uh, has an effect uh, in the uh, early step of HBV infection. So the, uh, today I cannot show the uh, uh, detailed information of SO145, but uh, when we uh, take a look at the, uh, this compound, and uh, this compound has a very similar structure to INT767. Uh, which is also a uh, viral uh, 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 derivatives uh, reported by uh, Dr. Uh, Ito uh, Aichi uh, Medical University uh, in Hepatology 2021. And uh, in his research, uh, he showed that uh, uh, this compound uh, uh, inhibits HBV infection through the interference of press one MTCP binding. And this compound binds to the uh, HBV uh, particle and inhibit the uh, MTCP binding. And uh, we uh, examined whether our compound and INT76 
uh, had a, a different mechanism for anti-HPV uh, uh, reaction. So we examine uh, whether the uh, SO145 can inhibit PRES1 and TCP binding, and uh, we uh, label PRES1 uh, uh, using uh, the uh, uh, fluorescent uh, uh, signals, and uh, uh, we examine the uh, APRES1 and TCP binding. And however, the SO145 uh, has no inhibitory effect on uh, PRES1 and TCP binding step, as you can see here. So we also check that uh, SO145 uh, uh, the inhibitory effect of uh, PRES1 internalization. So as you can see here, uh, PRES1 uh, is stained like this, and they are in the control cells, uh, PRES1 can enter uh, into the cells, and the uh, NTCP also are uh, uh, incorporated into the cells. Uh, and the G signals are merged here. But uh, in the presence of SO145, NTCP uh, still remains in the uh, plasma membrane and they cannot enter into the cells together with PRESS1. So uh, this uh, result suggests that SO145 inhibits press one internalization. So as you can see here. And then we checked whether SO145 can inhibit HBB promoter activity. And we checked the four H, uh, HBB uh, viral promoters activity using uh, uh, luciferase assay. But the, uh, as you can see here, SO145 uh, cannot uh, inhibit uh, HBB uh, promoters. So uh, uh, this result uh, indicates SO145 uh, cannot uh, inhibit HBB promoter activity. So uh, currently, uh, it's still uh, unclear how SO145 inhibits HBV infection, but uh, uh, to date, we, we can uh, say that uh, uh, NT67 uh, binds to the viral particles and inhibit the uh, receptor binding, but the SO145 uh, has a different action, and the SO145 may inhibit the uh, internalization of HBV. Uh, into the cells. So from uh, these uh, results, uh, here is a, a conclusion of the first uh, part. SO145 uh, is a, a novel uh, uh, anti-HBV agent and uh, bio acid derivatives. SO145 can inhibit HBB infection at the early phase of the HBB life cycle via uh, NTCP. And SO145 uh, does not suppress the PRESS1 NTCP binding uh, process. And the, uh, probably uh, SO145 inhibits the PRESS1 internalization. And uh, we have to uh, work on the details of uh, action of uh, SO145. Okay, so the next topic is uh, done by uh, Assistant Professor uh, Dan Lin, uh, who is a supervisor of the uh, Adi uh, Arifianto, and uh, they work uh, each other. And uh, uh, so uh, Dr. Dan uh, works on the, uh, try to identify the Nobel host factor which can interact with HBX protein and uh, analyze the uh, role of PRDX, PRDX1 in HBV uh, life cycle.
So uh, HBX protein in, uh, is very important protein, as I uh, showed you. Uh, Dr. Koike showed that HBX uh, expressing transgenic mice develop hepatocellular carcinoma, and HBX plays key roles in uh, both HBV replication and uh, HCC development. And uh, HBX is a very small protein, uh, the um, 154 amino acid protein, and uh, in the in the terminal part, it has a regulatory domain and the 14-3C binding domain and the uh, transactivation domain and uh, uh, DDB1 binding domain and also a P53 binding domain and. Uh, known as a, uh, a multifunctional regulator that modulates various cellular activities, including gene transcription, signal transduction, cell cycle progression, and apoptosis through interaction with other host factors. So in the beginning of this research, uh, Dr. Dem performed the uh, uh, tandem affinity purification uh, to identify the uh, HBX binding patterns from the cells. And uh, she identified uh, peroxyredoxin 1 uh, as a, a novel HBX binding uh, protein. Peroxyredoxin 1, uh, PRDX1, is a uh, 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 protein with the molecular weight of uh, 25 kilodalton protein and ubiquitous re ex expressed in uh, various tissues, including liver. And PRDX1 uh, localized in the cytoplasm and also uh, in the nucleus. And the PRDX1 uh, basically function as a hydrogen peroxide scavenger and, uh, and also PRDX1 is reported uh, to function as a, a tumor suppressor. And uh, PRDX1 can bind to RNA and RNA binding protein. And uh, our laboratory uh, uh, previously reported that uh, E6AP ubiquitin ligase mediates ubiquitin dependent degradation of uh, PRDX1. And the uh, PRX1 is known to function in various uh, viruses, and the PRX1 is required for the uh, efficient replication of measles virus, and PRX1 positively regulates the pro propagation of H5N1 influenza virus and PRDX1 is incorporated into the vaccine viral particles. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, for HBB, uh, it's unclear uh, what PRDX1 uh, does for viral infections. So our question is, uh, what is the role of PRDX1 HBX interaction in HBB life cycle? So uh, in this study, uh, we aim to clarify the PRDX1 binding domain on HBX protein and to determine the role of PRDX1 HBX interaction in HBV life cycle. So we made a series of HBX deletion mutants and uh, we identified that the uh, amino acid 16 to 20, this part, this small part is very important for the interaction with uh, PRDX1. If, you, uh, if we uh, delete the, the HBX, uh, this deletion mutant cannot bind uh, to PRDX1, but uh, uh, other mutant uh, binds. And uh, so in summary, uh, uh, six, I mean, acid 16 to 20 is important for or the interaction with uh, PRDX1. So uh, HBX, uh, I mean, acid 16 and 220 is well conserved among 
HBV genotypes, and we introduced the mutation which amino acid is important, and we performed alanine scanning, and uh, we identified that uh, uh, cysteine uh, 17 of HBX is crucial for the interaction with endogenous PRDX1. So as you can see here, if we introduce the mutation uh, to uh, this only one amino acid, HBX cannot bind to PRDX1 anymore. And uh, uh, then we uh, examine the specificity of the interaction and uh, HBX can uh, interact uh, with uh, PRDX1. The uh, HBV protein, HBC cannot interact with uh, PRDX1. Then we uh, examine the cellular uh, localization of HBX and PRDX1, and the uh, uh, HBX and PRDX1 are co-localized in the uh, uh, perinuclear region. So uh, then we ask the question uh, how P HBX PRDX1 interaction is important in uh, HPV uh, life cycle. So we analyzed the expression level of HBV RNA and viral proteins, and we uh, examined the stability of HBV RNA. So uh, we uh, knocked down the P uh, endogenous PRDX1 in the cells, and uh, uh, we uh, examined the uh, levels of HBV RNA. So we knocked down PRDX1 using siRNA, and uh, we examined the uh, uh, HBV RNA, uh, uh, not only genotype B to C and D. And uh, uh, when we knock down uh, PRDX1, uh, HBV RNA levels uh, increased, as you can see here. So this result uh, suggests that PRDX1 is an inhibitory, uh, has an inhibitory effect on HBV RNA. So uh, then we uh, look, uh, also uh, performed the knockdown experiment of PRDX1 and they, uh, examined the HBV proteins. And as you can see here, uh, HBS uh, proteins are increased uh, in the uh, PRDX1 knockdown uh, cells. So uh, therefore, uh, we, uh, this result suggests that PRDX1 decreases the levels of HBV antigens in HBV replicating cells. So then uh, we uh, used the uh, uh, HEP38.7 TET cells. So this can induce HBV expression and uh, so uh, then we uh, removed the uh, tetracycline and the HBV uh, expression starts. And then, uh, we uh, compare the control cells and the PRDX1 siRNA knockdown cells. And as you can see here, intracellular HBV RNA uh, was uh, increased and as well as Ex extracellular HBV DNA, HBV antigen, and HBS. And uh, so uh, this uh, means that the PRDX1 uh, has a negative uh, regulatory factor for HBV propagation. Then, uh, yeah, so then we uh, asked the question, and uh, how uh, this can happen. And the uh, PRDX1 uh, may uh, reduce HBV RNA via transcriptional uh, uh, mechanisms or post transcriptional mechanisms. So the, uh, we examine the, which is important for uh, this inhibitory effect. 
And uh, when we knock down PRDX1 and the uh, major uh, promoter of HBB promoters, for uh, HBB promoters, but uh, there was no change uh, in these promoters. So this uh, means that the PRDX1 mediated uh, reduction of HBB RNA is not due to a transcriptional inhibition. Uh, trans transcription uh, level is not altered by uh, PRDX1. Then we uh, compare the uh, HBB RNA uh, levels. The, uh, we knock down PRDX1 in the cells using uh, sRNA, and we compare the uh, HBB RNA. So uh, we uh, uh, treated the cells with uh, actinomycin D RNA polymerase inhibitor, and uh, this uh, blocked the de novo uh, RNA synthesis. And uh, we can chase the uh, RNA uh, levels uh, by measuring the RNA. And uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, so the control sRNA shows like this, but uh, when we uh, uh, knock down PRDX1 by sRNA, HBB RNA level uh, gets stabilized, as you can see here. But uh, when we uh, examine the same experiment, uh, but uh, in the absence of HBX, HBX lacking HBB, uh, this change has not uh, occurred. So uh, these results suggest that PRDX1 participates in HBB RNA degradation via the interaction uh, with HBX. Okay, so uh, then we ask the question uh, whether the PRDX1 has any effect on the host RNAs, and uh, we chose uh, housekeeping genes, but uh, uh, then we uh, knock down the uh, PRDX1, but uh, there is no difference uh, in the control cells and the uh, knock PRDX1 knockdown cells. Uh, the, uh, these results suggest that PRDX1 mediated HBB RNA degradation uh, is uh, a very uh, specific event and uh, not due to the downregulation of the host RNAs. So the, uh, then we ask the question how PRDX1 decreases HBB RNA stability. And uh, there is a, a no mechanism uh, contributing to the RNA reduction, uh, which is the RNA exosome complex. So in, uh, before that, we uh, examined whether uh, PRDX1 can bind to HBB RNA. Uh, we did uh, RNA co-immunoprecipitation assay, RIP assay, and we uh, pulled down the frag tag PRDX1 using a frag antibody, and uh, we performed the RT-QPCR. And the, uh, uh, when uh, we used the anti-frag antibody, uh, we got uh, this amount of RNA, but the uh, control uh, IgG, cannot bring down uh, HBB RNA. So this means that uh, PRDX1 can bind to HBB RNA uh, specifically. Then we uh, map the interaction domain uh, on uh, HBB RNA. So the, we ask the question of which part is important for the binding to PRDX1. And we made a, a series of uh, RNA and uh, assay for the interaction. And uh, we found that these two parts are important for interaction with PRDX1. And uh, so 
Then we ask the question, which machinery is important for the uh, PRDX1 mediated HBV RNA degradation? And uh, several groups have reported that the uh, exosome complex is uh, important for HBV RNA decay. And uh, we ask the question whether these uh, components are important for the uh, reduction of HBV RNA. And uh, we knocked down PRDX1 and uh, XOPC5. Uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, when we double knocked down, we got uh, uh, the stabilized HBV RNA. And uh, uh, so this means that uh, uh, XOPC5 and PRDX1 are cooperatively involved in HBV RNA decay. Okay, here is our model. So the uh, PRDX1 and XOPC5 and HBX uh, uh, form the uh, protein complex, and uh, uh, these uh, two machineries are important for HBV RNA degradation and uh, induces uh, the down regulation of HBV propagation. So the, from this point of view, uh, we can say that PRDX1 is a, a host defense uh, factor uh, to HBV infection. Okay, uh, uh, here is a summary of the second topic. Uh, PRDX1 is a novel HBX interacting protein, and PRDX1 interacts with uh, HBV RNA. And uh, PRDX1 accelerates HBV RNA decay through interaction with HBX and XOC5, leading to down regulation of HBV RNA. And the PRDX1 is a host factor which negatively uh, regulates HBV uh, propagation. Okay, uh, here is our laboratory member. The, we have many uh, young researchers from uh, uh, Gajabada uh, University and uh, 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 so Gandhi-san and Adi-san, Aurya-san and Maria-san, uh, they are from uh, Gajamada, and uh, uh, Futu-san and Lash-san are from uh, uh, Udayana University. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Dan Lee, and uh, he is a uh, uh, Takayuki Abe uh, associate professor. And, uh, uh, Chieko Matsui, uh, she is an uh, uh, assistant professor. And uh, we have newcomers, uh, Rido san and Lewa san, and also uh, Jo san, uh, she is a Chinese uh, uh, young uh, student. And uh, we often uh, celebrate things uh, eating cakes because Kobe is famous for sweets. Okay, so. Uh, the finally, I'd like to thank all our uh, laboratory members and also uh, many collaborators, uh, 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 especially uh, uh, Dr. Shimotono, Dr. Matsura, Dr. Suzuki, and Dr. Ueda, and Dr. Hatano, and Dr. Wakita, and uh, Dr. Muramatsu, uh, and uh, Dr. Nishitsuji. Okay, okay, thank you very much for your uh, kind uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you. We give applause for Professor Ikosochi. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for Professor Ikosochi uh, for your interesting lecture that gave uh, us wider horizon for the hepatitis B infection. And we, st we hope that you will stay with, stay with us until the next uh, set, set speaker. Uh, next is Prof. Uh, Dr. Mysuri Khalid. Uh, she is a lecturer and staff at the Hasanuddin University. And uh, she is very active in lecturing, also the training about the uh, triple elimination that uh, those are the prevention of the hepatitis B and uh, syphilis and also it's IV from mother to child uh, transmission. Uh, 
oke please dokter Maisuri Halid it is your time thank you uh, dokter Asani uh, allow me to share my screen Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the committee of this meeting that invited me to give the guest lecture in this afternoon. And <clears throat> secondly, I, I would like to give this lecture in Bahasa in order to have a, a easier understanding for our resident. Uh, uh, this, uh, my, my theme is upstream prevention of hepatitis B vertical transmission. Uh, sorry, is there any of you hear the sound of azan here because we are entering um, uh, as a uh, praying, if, uh, if you don't mind me, we keep yeah, okay. uh, silent first okay, Dr. Um, until the asam uh, uh, finish. Mohon maaf tadi karena suara azan yang uh, terdengar saya kira lebih baik kita berhenti sejenak tadi dan kita lanjutkan uh, seperti yang saya kemukakan tadi bahwa mungkin lebih mudah untuk teman-teman uh, residen untuk memahami uh, kuliah saya dalam bahasa Indonesia. Uh, judulnya adalah Upstream Prevention of Hepatitis B Vertical Transmission. Uh, pencegahan hepatitis B transmisi uh, dari hulu. Uh, kita tahu bahwa tadi sudah dijelaskan oleh Profesor Kuo bahwa uh, masalah hepatitis B kronik infeksi di, di seluruh dunia ini menjadi beban besar untuk dunia. 
kita, uh, kalau kita lihat di daerah Afrika paling tinggi sebetulnya di daerah Afrika sekitar 82 juta dan daerah kita sebetulnya di daerah uh, Asia, Asia Tenggara itu sekitar 60 juta jadi cukup tinggi juga dan kemat, kematian akibat hepatitis B ini juga sangat tinggi tadi diperkirakan sekitar 1 juta kalau terakhir angkanya sekitar 820 ribu uh, di tahun 2019 meninggal karena sirosis ataupun karsinoma hepatoseluler. Di antaranya di Southeast Asia di Asia Tenggara sekitar 6 juta anak balita itu hidup sebagai penderita hepatitis B. Nah tadi ini juga sudah sangat baik dijelaskan oleh Prof Iko bahwa hepatitis B virus ini mempunyai empat open reading frame ya yang ada uh, ORF surface ya untuk yang memberi menandai ya uh, surface protein HBS antigen kemudian RFC itu untuk pre-core and core protein kemudian ada jadi ORF polymerase ini yang bagian bagian dalam adalah uh, yang di sini ya ini kalau kita lihat open reading frame-nya tadi ya bahwa uh, tadi itu sudah dijelaskan yang S ini pre S1 pre S2 dan S kemudian polymerase ya kemudian XPS protein uh, saya percepat saja karena tadi cukup banyak cukup banyak ya dijelaskan saya ingin mengingatkan kembali uh, kita bagaimana memahami lebih mudah uh, secara uh, serologik dari virus hepatitis ini. Uh, tadi dikatakan bahwa bagian luar dari virus ini adalah lipid bilayer, yaitu ada lots uh, surface uh, protein, HBS antigen semuanya, medium dan small. Nah, HBS antigen ini yang menjadi penanda bahwa uh, infeksi sedang berlangsung. It is ongoing infection. Ya. Kemudian di bagian dalam di plate capsid itu adalah core antigen. Ini yang menandakan bahwa ada infeksi lampau atau pernah terpapar. Uh, infeksi natural. Kemudian di bagian envelope, ya, bagian di antaranya ini antara lipid bilayer dan nucleic acid ada e antigen ini menunjukkan bahwa virus sedang aktif bereplikasi. Nah, <tuh> anti HBS itu merupakan anti terhadap HBS antigen yang e, bermakna bahwa imunitas terjadi imunitas bisa karena vaksinasi, vaksinasi ataupun bisa karena natural. Uh, immunity. Kemudian uh, untuk anti HBC sebetulnya yang kita periksa dalam pemeriksaan serologi adalah anti HBC-nya, ya karena core antigen HBC antigen itu tidak bisa kita periksa yang kita periksa di dalam serum adalah anti HBC itu yang menunjukkan bahwa uh, tadi pernah ada uh, apa infeksi lampau. Kemudian untuk uh, anti terhadap HBE AG adalah anti HBE. Kalau anti HBE-nya yang positif itu menandakan bahwa dia tidak aktif lagi bereplikasi. Sementara kalau HBE antigen yang negatif itu uh, dia tidak biasanya kalau anti HBE positif tidak aktif bereplikasi, kalau HBE AG-nya positif berarti dia aktif bereplikasi. Itu uh, secara sederhana mungkin gambaran bagaimana kita memahami serologi dari virus hepatitis. Nah, tadi juga sudah dijelaskan dengan sangat baik bagaimana uh, siklus replikasi uh, virus hepatitis B ini bahwa uh, virus ini mengapa sulit diobati karena ada sisi-sisi DNA yang uh, apa, secara persisten berada di dalam nukleus dari uh, sel hati. Sehingga uh, walaupun misalnya diberikan potent antiviral treatment uh, sangat sulit ya menembus ini sehingga uh, itu sebabnya uh, hepatitis B virus uh, apa, cukup sulit dibanding misalnya hepatitis C karena uh, sisi-sisi DNA-nya ini tetap tinggal di dalam uh, nukleus. 
Eh, bagaimana eh, outcome dari infeksi ini? Perjalanannya cukup panjang, 10 sampai 20 tahun, mulai dari akut infection, kemudian berkembang dalam sampai 20 tahun menjadi kronik, sirosis dan eh, cancer. Eh, bisa saja terjadi resolusi dari kronik eh, infection, tetapi eh, pada progresnya, kalau terutama kalau misalnya imunitas dan orang tersebut tidak di apa diproteksi dengan vaksinasi biasanya akan berkembang menjadi sirosis uh, dan cancer uh, liver cancer. Bagaimana perjalanan hepatitis B uh, secara alami terutama pada ibu hamil? Kita bicara pada ibu hamil. Kita tahu pada bahwa pada kehamilan itu terjadi, terjadi fase imun toleran di mana pada fase imun toleran Uh, seorang ibu hamil akan mengakomodir uh, si bayi, si janin, si tetus, uh, sehingga tidak mengalami rejection. Sehingga uh, reaks, respon imunnya itu tertekan, makanya disebut fase imun toleran. Akibatnya apa? Sekalipun misalnya si ibu hamil ini terinfeksi hepatitis dengan viral load yang cukup tinggi, HBV DNA-nya tinggi, tetapi gambaran manifestasi kliniknya, gambaran ALT, fungsi hatinya itu tidak tinggi, tetap normal. Dan <tuh> biasanya walaupun HBAG-nya positif, ya, jadi ibunya tidak itrus, ya, e, tidak menunjukkan tanda-tanda bahwa dia mengalami infeksi di hatinya. Nah ini biasanya hasilnya pun juga e, tidak menunjukkan e, kelainan. Walaupun misalnya tadi HBAG-nya positif, kemudian HBV DNA-nya di atas 20 ribu. Tetapi kalau kemudian dia masuk ke fase yang imun aktif, maka biasanya ini uh, fluktuasi ya, uh, ALT-nya. Kemudian walaupun HBV DNA-nya sudah mulai turun, tetapi ALT-nya mulai naik. Dan ini biasanya menunjukkan adanya inflamasi aktif dari sel hati. Nah, setelah itu biasanya dia uh, mengalami fase uh, inaktif ya dan kalau misalnya treatmentnya tidak uh, adekuat biasanya dia bisa kembali aktif tetapi pada fase kehamilan uh, kita uh, ingat kembali bahwa dia berada fase imun toleran di mana walaupun HBV DNA tinggi titer HBV nya tinggi uh, gambaran SGPT nya akan tetap normal karena uh, fase yang imun toleran tadi. Nah, <tuh> bagaimana uh, virus hepatitis B ini ditransmisi? Bisa melalui intrauterine, bisa melalui uh, pada saat persalinan dan bisa postpartum. Intrauterine bisa melalui infeksi pada plasenta dan germline infection. Bisa juga pada saat uh, persalinan, yaitu ada ada apa? direct kontak antara infected fluid dari ibu ke janinnya bisa juga mikrotransmission setelah partus juga bisa saja masih bisa terjadi apa transmisi tetapi paling besar itu adalah pada saat intrapartum nah hal-hal yang berperan dalam transmisi vertikal dari ibu ke bayi yang pertama adalah viral load kalau viral load semakin tinggi viral loadnya HBV DNA nya semakin tinggi maka semakin besar kemungkinan transmisi ke bayi kemudian HBAG status tadi kalau dia positif akan besar kemungkinan terjadi transmisi uh, mode of delivery ini uh, banyak masih banyak kontroversi tetapi uh, Apabila persalinan berlangsung sangat lama, ya maka kemungkinan uh, attachment antara uh, kepala bayi dengan uh, traktus genitalia ibu itu juga lebih lama, sehingga kemungkinan terjadi uh, transmisi di situ. Kemudian mutasi, mutasi HBV gene variation dan Mungkin pada neonatal itu terjadi defisiensi imun. Ini uh, kelima faktor yang mungkin menyebabkan terjadinya transmisi dari ibu ke bayinya. Nah kalau kita lihat uh, tadi saya jelaskan bahwa sebagian besar kalau HBAG-nya positif artinya 
virus aktif bereplikasi, maka sebagian besar pula HBV DNA-nya atau viral load-nya juga akan tinggi. Sehingga kemungkinan besar untuk terjadi transmisi di sekitar uh, lebih besar juga. Ya. Kemudian kalau dia HBE agennya negatif, kita lihat bahwa sebagian besar juga HBV DNA-nya juga rendah. Sehingga kemungkinan untuk transmisi juga lebih rendah. Uh, tetapi ada ada yang dikatakan imunoprofilaksis failure atau uh, kegagalan vaksinasi. Hal itu bisa terjadi apabila uh, HBV DNA atau viral load dari ibu yang terinfeksi tadi itu sangat tinggi. Di sini dilihat bahwa lebih dari 6 log ya, uh, 10 pangkat uh, 6 ya, 1 juta. Kalau dia konversi IU sekitar lebih dari 200 ribu uh, IU per, mili, per mililiter. Kalau itu tinggi biasanya Sekalipun bayi divaksinasi, biasanya bisa lolos juga. Itu yang disebut imunoprofilaksis failure. Jadi kalau viral load-nya sangat tinggi, sekalipun bayi divaksinasi, kemungkinan lolos juga bisa terjadi. Atau yang kita sebut vaksin escape, mutation. Beberapa mekanisme yang mungkin terjadi juga pada kegagalan imunoprofilaksis pada saat konsepsi di mana line of infection bisa membawa seperti sperma ataupun ovum atau during pregnancy misalnya dilakukan uh, apa uh, amniosintesis atau ada infeksi plasenta atau during life, uh, kalau dalam persalinan uh, kemungkinan terjadi persalinan uh, pervaginal tetapi ini juga uh, masih banyak kontroversi sebab sangat tergantung dari kadar viral load dan ketuban yang sudah pecah sehingga eh, kesimpulannya biasanya kalau dia semakin tinggi HBV DNA-nya atau semakin tinggi viral load-nya semakin besar kemungkinan transmisi demikian juga kalau HBAG-nya positif juga semakin besar kemungkinan transmisi. Nah ini salah satu eh, publikasi saya tentang eh, eh, HBAG negatif antigen ya yang pada ibu hamil yang kita kami dapatkan itu bisa juga terjadi uh, ter, uh, masuk ke uh, sirkulasi janin ya jadi kita yang di sini judulnya a cautionary note jadi kehati-hatian bahwa HBAG negatif tidak berarti aman sekali sebab ada juga ternyata HBAG negatif yang mempunyai kadar viral load yang tinggi. Nah, itu kami dapatkan di sini dari kami melakukan penelitian sekitar 1348 sampel ibu. Kemudian kami dapatkan ada 10 uh, mutasi di situ ya, uh, 12 ya, 12 mutasi uh, pada uh, BCP and PC varian ya. Nah, ini kemudian kami cocokkan dengan darah ibunya dan ternyata cocok dan Uh, ini membuktikan bahwa uh, kita jangan menganggap bahwa HBAG itu uh, yang negatif itu betul-betul aman. Tetapi memang secara populasi sebagian besar yang HBAG positif itu viral load-nya uh, lebih tinggi. Tetapi HBAG negatif pada populasi juga kita harus hati-hati sebab kita di Asia cukup banyak yang mempunyai HBAG negatif dibanding HBAG positif dan ada sebagian kecil di antara yang HBAG negatif itu juga ternyata mempunyai viral load yang tinggi apabila terjadi mutasi pada uh, basal core promoter ataupun uh, prekor uh, genin. Nah, <tuh> itu tadi pada ini. Dan bagaimana efek infeksi pada neonatus dan anak? Ternyata sama, biasanya mereka uh, pada fase imunotoleran. Tidak tampak ada iktrus dan tidak uh, akan diketahui apabila tidak dilakukan uh, apa, testing. ya Kemudian uh, juga tanda-tanda uh, peningkatan ALT juga tidak terlalu tinggi. Dan yang menjadi catatan bahwa Semakin muda umurnya, maka semakin besar kemungkinan terjadi infeksi kronik. Kalau kita lihat di sini, kalau dia neonatus itu 90 persen 
kemungkinan untuk menjadi infeksi kronik dibanding misalnya dia sudah berumur 3 tahun itu 50 persen ataupun sudah dewasa dia akan tinggal menjadi 5 persen sehingga pada saat nematus pada saat newborn inilah yang seharusnya menjadi uh, apa titik uh, perhatian kita terutama OBGYN dengan pediatrician bahwa kita harus mengawal Jangan sampai terjadi transmisi dari ibu ke bayi, terutama karena bayi-bayi yang baru lahir ini, neonatus ini belum mempunyai innate immunity yang cukup uh, untuk uh, menangkal si virus hepatitis B ini. Nah, kalau kita lihat ini ya, tadi dikatakan mengapa neonatus ya, kalau dia terinfeksi dibanding orang dewasa. Kalau orang dewasa ya, lebih banyak itu... Uh, In apparent disease, ya. Kemudian 90 sampai 99 persen recover karena mereka sudah mempunyai kekebalan, ya, sudah mempunyai mungkin uh, innate immunity yang cukup baik, ya, sehingga sangat kecil kemungkinan kalau mereka kena itu menjadi uh, karsinoma hepatosiler ataupun sirosis hepatis. Beda halnya kalau infeksi itu terjadi pada masa neonatus, ya, 95 persen mereka akan menjadi kronik apabila tidak diproteksi dengan vaksinasi mereka akan berkembang menjadi sirosis ataupun karsinoma hepatosiler itulah sebabnya bahwa uh, kita uh, objin dan uh, neonatologi ini berperan penting dalam uh, siklus transmisi dari ibu ke bayi bagaimana kita mencegah hal ini bisa terjadi uh, di, uh, dikatakan bahwa Uh, as the chance of acquiring chronic HBV infection is the highest during the perinatal period, sehingga the prevention of mother to child transmission during pregnancy and delivery is crucial and provides the, uh, provides the optimal opportunity to begin HBV elimination. Uh, oleh karena uh, mother to child transmission ini uh, sangat tinggi. Ya, uh, di highly endemic area di mana the majority of chronic HBV cases are result of mother to child transmission. Jadi untuk daerah-daerah endemik seperti Indonesia, daerah Asia itu yang mayoritas ada adalah mother to child transmission atau vertical transmission. Untuk daerah-daerah yang non endemik seperti daerah Eropa, daerah Barat itu yang dominan adalah uh, adult ya yang uh, mungkin transmisi horizontal. Jadi untuk kita yang highly endemic itu memang mayoritas karena perinatal infection. Jadi ada konsekuensinya. Jadi infeksi terhadap ibu yang membawa hepatitis B itu itu akan ditularkan ke bayinya dan si bayi Uh, ini akan memberikan men, uh, uh, horizontal dan si ibu akan menjadi horizontal transmission menjadi reservoir untuk infeksi hepatitis B ya dan si bayi pun juga akan berkembang demikian kalau tidak mendapatkan proteksi vaksinasi nah ini gambaran dari uh, survei demografi Indonesia basic health survey uh, 2013 Ya, kalau kita lihat sebetulnya Indonesia sudah bergerak maju dari tadinya highly endemic di atas 8% persen eh, pada tahun 2013 kita prevalensinya sudah turun 7,1 persen sedikit turun 7,1 persen tetapi kalau dikalikan dengan jumlah penduduk Indonesia sekitar 18 juta penduduk Indonesia yang 18 million people infected by hepatitis B. Indonesian people, jadi seluruh untuk Indonesia berdasarkan hasil riset kesehatan dasar ini. Nah, kalau dari hasil ini kalau kita lihat ya trennya ya umur balita ya, kemudian kita lihat HBSAG positif ini ya, kemudian makin meningkat pada umur tua ya. Nah, sekarang bagian itu kan kelihatan bahwa Infeksi kontinu terjadi, tetap kontinu terjadi. Kemudian kita lihat anti HBC-nya, ya, di uh, grup uh, mulai dari kelompok umur uh, balita sampai dewasa. 
trennya seperti ini ya artinya semakin tua umur semakin tinggi semakin banyak yang anti HBC nya positif artinya kemungkinan yang terjadi di sini ini adalah horizontal transmission ya karena kita lihat anti HBC nya yang positif tadi saya katakan bahwa anti HBC positif bisa menandakan infeksi yang lampau ya kemungkinan terjadi transmisi horizontal kemudian kita lihat bagaimana anti HBS anti HBS itu menggambarkan imunitas apakah imunitas karena in, uh, vaksinasi ataukah imunitas alami natural nah ternyata dari <coughs> uh, uh, apa gambar ini ini tahunnya uh, kalau kita ambil titik di tahun 1997 ya uh, maka orang-orang uh, yang mengalami uh, HBSAG-nya positif itu akan decrease turun ya semakin tua umur semakin turun HBSAG positif untuk yang umur lebih tua itu makin naik maka ini akan kita lihat bahwa ini adalah uh, hasil dari infeksi uh, karena alami secara alami kemudian ini karena vaksinasi ya jadi seperti itu mau di apa ini dok di kasih suara deh uh, tolong suaranya lolos ya jadi sebelum tahun 1997 itu yang tinggi anti ABS nya itu menunjukkan uh, hasil dari vaksinasi atau imunisasi setelah tahun eh, eh sesudah sorry sesudah tahun 97 itu kan di uh, vaksinasi nasional ya itu uh, yang terjadi adalah uh, hasil dari vaksinasi sebelum tahun 97 yaitu orangnya usianya lebih tua ya itu yang ada terjadi adalah kekebalan karena uh, natural immunity jadi seperti itu uh, nah yang menjadi Pertanyaan sekarang adalah untuk kita OBGYN. Ternyata di bawah umur lima tahun itu satu sampai empat itu masih ada saja 4,2 persen yang positif. Padahal eh, program imunisasi nasional hepatitis B sudah dimulai tahun 1997. Artinya setelah 10 tahun program ini berjalan lebih dari 10 tahun program ini berjalan. Ternyata masih ada saja bayi eh, apa anak di bawah lima tahun yang habis akhirnya positif. Nah ini yang menjadi pertanyaan, apakah masalah di cakupan vaksinasi ataukah memang ada imunoprofilaksis failure? Karena harusnya ini lebih rendah ya atau mendekati 0% persen karena eh, vaksinasi sudah berlangsung sejak tahun 1997. Oleh karena itu, target dari prevention mother to child transmission itu paling efektif kita memutus di rantai ini, ya, di siklus ini, supaya tidak terjadi lagi transmisi uh, horizontal selanjutnya. Nah, apa yang kami uh, katakan di judul tadi bahwa upstream uh, strategi untuk prevention mother to child transmission. Kita lihat disease burden. Disease burden Semakin cepat disis itu diketahui, maka semakin uh, uh, dini bisa diperbaiki. Costnya akan lebih kecil, reversibility-nya akan lebih baik. Tetapi semakin lama, semakin uh, lambat di, di uh, treatment, maka yang terjadi adalah sirosis atau karsinoma hepatosululer, di mana costnya akan lebih besar dan reversibility-nya akan lebih menurun. Bagaimana uh, aksi atau uh, bagaimana tindakan kita untuk mengetahui risiko lebih awal tentu harus kita menyingkirkan dulu risikonya. Jadi harus dimulai dari ibu. Untuk mengontrol itu tentu mungkin ibunya kita harus menyiapkan program-program untuk pencegahan, untuk persiapan persalinannya, kemudian uh, untuk memberikan uh, vaksinasi ke bayi dan sebagainya. Kemudian uh, selanjutnya tentu akan lebih besar effort yang harus dilakukan 
untuk uh, mengatasi penyakit hepatitis B ini. Sehingga semakin dini, semakin early kita melakukan uh, action, maka semakin baik tentu luaran yang akan kita dapatkan. Oleh karena itu yang saya katakan tadi bahwa semakin dulu, semakin awal kita melakukan strateginya untuk mengatasi ini, maka akan semakin baik. Dan peran ini, peran pada ibu itu lebih banyak dipegang oleh kita, para apa, dokter objin, bidang. Ya. Jadi kontrol untuk hepatitis should start from the mother. Kalau kita mau prevention, itu harusnya dimulai dari ibu. Itu adalah upstream strategi atau strategi dari hulu. Kalau tidak, kita terlalu besar dana atau terlalu besar effort yang harus kita lakukan untuk memperbaiki uh, penyakit ini. Oleh karena itu, WHO sudah memberikan strategi, ya paling bawah itu pemberian vaksinasi, kemudian uh, screening, kemudian pemberian HBIG dan antiviral. Uh, dan <tuh> ini mungkin semacam uh, apa? Simpulan, bukan simpulan ya, ringkasan ya dari apa yang kita lakukan during pregnancy kita lakukan antenatal care, hepatitis B screening, kemudian during labor kita uh, memberikan uh, apa pemberian HB0 dan HBIG, birth dose dan pemberian HBIG dalam 24 jam. Kemudian postpartum kita melakukan pemberian uh, hepatitis B 1, 2, 3 dan tetap breast feeding. Juga tentu pemantauan. Nah ini yang during pregnancy. Bagaimana kalau HBS AG-nya positif? Seharusnya diperiksa HBE AG-nya. Uh, kemudian diperiksa atau diperiksa HBV DNA. Kalau misalnya HBV DNA tidak memadai, HBE AG kita bisa pakai. Kalau dia positif, kemungkinan dia viral load-nya tinggi. Dan yang lain juga kita harus periksa SGPT atau alt -nya. Kalau dia negatif, ya seperti biasa kita lanjutkan dengan <coughs> uh, pemberian vaksinasi nanti untuk bayinya. Uh, selama persalinan apa yang dilakukan, ya untuk yang uh, mereka yang menerima antiviral, untuk yang hepatitis B positif dan viral loadnya tinggi, biasanya dia akan menerima antiviral dan antiviralnya akan dihentikan setelah bayi lahir kurang lebih 1 sampai 3 bulan dan tetap dimonitor ALT-nya. Uh, antiviral dikontinu sampai uh, 3 bulan tetapi belakangan itu satu bulan saja cukup. Kemudian hu, um, untuk mereka yang menerima antiviral sebelum kehamilan itu dilanjutkan antiviralnya. Jadi misalnya mungkin orangnya sudah hepatitis B sebelum hamil itu tetap melanjutkan. Nah, bagaimana yang uh, pada saat postpartum seperti biasa diberikan vaksinasi untuk bayinya? Uh, untuk bayi yang uh, ibunya terinfeksi diberikan HBIG dalam 12 jam dan HB0 atau hepa hepatitis berdosnya. First dose ya, yang ini ada yang monovalen, kemudian sekarang sudah ada yang combine ya, sampai 4 dosis. Nah, pemerintah sudah mempunyai program untuk uh, P2 hepatitis ini uh, uh, yang sampai sekarang kita kenal dengan triple eliminasi bersama-sama dengan uh, sifilis dan HIV. Ya. Nah, uh, targetnya 2030 kita bisa menekan prevalensi sampai 0,1 persen pada anak. Ya. Kemudian capaian untuk deteksi hepatitis B itu lebih dari 90 persen dan Uh, untuk eliminasi hepatitis C bisa diobati sampai 80 persen. Itu sudah ada permenkesnya. Nah, ini <tuh> situasi uh, paling update sampai tahun 2021, ya. Bagaimana jumlah ibu hamil yang diperiksa deteksi dini hepatitis B uh, dari 2017 saya lihat sampai 2021 hampir 3 juta. Kita tahu bahwa jumlah ibu hamil di Indonesia sekitar 4,8 sampai 5 juta. Jadi sebetulnya sudah lebih dari setengah ibu hamil itu pada tahun 2021 sudah diperiksa hepatitis B-nya. Kita lihat di puskesmas sudah jalan program itu. Dan yang positif itu kita lihat cenderung menurun ya dari 2,21 persen menjadi tinggal 1,21 persen. Nah, 
kemudian nah ini kan kita lihat yang jumlah reaktif ini jumlahnya itu dalam persentase 1,61 persen jadi dari hampir 3 juta ibu yang dideteksi dini hepatitis B ada sekitar 1,6 persen yang positif reaktif hepatitis HBS AG positif nah ini mempunyai dua makna 1,6 persen ini mempunyai dua makna yaitu yang pertama risiko untuk komplikasi pada ibunya bahwa akan kemungkinan terjadi komplikasi untuk sekian banyak orang ini 36.673 <tuh> jadi uh, 1,6 persen ini tidak sedikit lebih 36.000 orang kemudian 36.673 ini ibu 95 persen diantaranya, diantaranya akan mengalami infeksi perinatal kalau kita tidak melakukan vaksinasi dengan pemberian HBIG dan HB0 dan kemudian dilanjutkan vaksinasi tiga dosis tadi. Sehingga, nah ini juga eh, data yang paling update ya tahun 2021 untuk hepatitis kita lihat pemberian bagaimana eh, kemajuan pemberian vaksinasi pemberian HB0 cukup baik 97 persen ya kemudian HBIG 96,9 persen, tetapi yang reaktif ya mungkin masih reaktif setelah uh, jalan program ini masih sekitar hampir 2 persen, 1, sekian persen. Karena 98,8 persen ini uh, non-reaktif untuk bayi di atas 9 bulan. Nah, WHO sudah membuat modeling bahwa sekalipun misalnya program vaksinasi berjalan baik dari tahun uh, lalu sampai nanti tahun 2030 itu masih berjalan baik uh, pemberian HBIG maupun HB0 dan vaksinasinya tetap kita tidak akan mampu mencapai eliminasi pada tahun 2030 kalau kita tidak memberikan antiviral jadi uh, WHO melakukan studi modeling dan mendapatkan bahwa kita tidak akan sukses melakukan eliminasi 2030 tanpa memberikan antiviral. Makanya keluar rekomendasi dari WHO yang terakhir tahun 2020 kemarin bahwa ibu yang habis agennya positif dengan kadar viral load atau HBV DNA-nya di atas 5,3 log 10 atau di atas 200.000 IU per mililiter itu harus diberikan tenofovir profilaksis mulai pada umur kehamilan 28 minggu sampai kurang lebih satu bulan setelah persalinan untuk mencegah transmisi dari ibu ke bayi tadi. <tuh> Kalau HBV DNA-nya tidak ada atau viral load-nya tidak ada, maka bisa digunakan HBAG. Ya, jadi kalau HBAG-nya positif, bisa diberikan antiviral. Nah, itu rekomendasi dari WHO. Jadi kurang lebih seperti ini, di terapi di trimester 3, kalau dia tidak ada sirosis, kemudian dua, uh, HBV DNA-nya rendah, tidak perlu diobati. Tetapi kalau dia uh, kurang dari 200 ribu, sekalipun HBV DNA-nya rendah, tetap dia ada tanda-tanda sirosis, dia harus diobati jangka panjang. Nah, ya, kita sudah sebetulnya sudah membicarakan itu di Kementerian Kesehatan. Nah, kapan memulai itu? Eh, tadi dikatakan bahwa early third trimester, jadi umur kehamilan 24, eh, 28 minggu, ya, eh, bisa sampai 4 sampai 6 minggu eh, akan muncul efeknya. Nah, yeah. antiviral apa? Biasanya kan yang ada lamivudin, telbivudin, tenofovir tetapi yang uh, prefer itu adalah tenofovir ya yang kelas B lamivudin itu kelas C dan lamivudin itu uh, kalau kita lihat lamivudin uh, banyak sudah cukup banyak terjadi resistensi sehingga yang dianjurkan adalah tenofovir disoproxil fumara kan ada juga tenofovir uh, alafenomid ya tapi yang dianjurkan adalah tenofovir di disoproxil fumara yang dikatakan prefer due to higher potency and minimize risk of emergence of viral resistance compared to lamp or terbifudin. Jadi <coughs> lebih dianjurkan tadi tenofovir. Kapan di stop? Dua menit lagi. Ada yang menganjurkan ya tiga bulan, ada yang menganjurkan satu bulan. Nah ini ini sudah mendekati terakhir. Uh, di Afrika di, dilakukan penelitian dan cukup efektif 
memberikan tenofovir dan birth dose vaccination tanpa memberikan HBG. Jadi kita tahu bahwa HBG challenge-nya besar karena harus jaga suhunya, kemudian harganya mahal dan untuk sampai ke remote area itu cukup apa susah. Sehingga kalau misalnya tenofovir ini bisa diberikan dan dipadukan dengan HB0, kemungkinan ini ini dari hasil studi di Afrika ini cukup efektif. Ya. Sehingga program kita di Indonesia, kita kemungkinan tahun 2023 akan memberikan tenofovir pada ibu hamil dengan viral load yang tinggi. Ya, kita lihat dia akan mulai pada enam provinsi dulu, yaitu Jawa Barat, Jawa Timur, Kalimantan Selatan, DKI Jakarta, dan Lampung. Tetapi tadi kebetulan tadi pagi jam 10 kami rapat komisi ahli hepatitis itu dikatakan bahwa akan ditambah menjadi 26 provinsi. Saya nggak tahu dananya bagaimana, tetapi saya dengar bukan hanya akan enam provinsi untuk pilot project, tapi akan ditambah 26 provinsi. Mudah-mudahan uh, sebagian besar akan mendapatkan. <tuh> nah ini yang terakhir bahwa New Global Health Sector Strategy itu kita targetnya 2030 kita bisa mencapai eliminasi viral hepatitis ya kemudian kita perlu meningkatkan sains teknologi dan inovasi dan harus ada uh, integrated dengan program HIV dan uh, STI uh, syphilis dan juga memperkuat ya integrasi dengan uh, berbagai sektor dengan meningkatkan koordinasi, desentralisasi, dan simplification. Jadi, uh, dibuat sesederhana mungkin, sesimpel mungkin. Saya kira itu saja barangkali dari saya. Terima kasih mudah-mudahan ke depan dengan program upstream uh, prevention of mother to child transmission kita bisa mencapai toward hepatitis day free generation. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oke, okay, give applause to Dr. Maisri Khaled. Um, that uh, give us the clear reason why to we should uh, prevent the transmission of hepatitis B uh, when uh, during F in the 12 hours uh, after birth. And what is the next step of the government to Uh, to eliminate the hepatitis B in the next for the next step. Uh, next lecture will be delivered by Dr. Adi Arifianto. Dr. Adi Arifianto is no is a PhD student in Kobe University, and he he is a medical student, Kajamada University at uh, Angkatan. 2011, eh, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, Dr. Adi Arkanto is uh, yes. the time use. Yes, Dr. Hasanuddin. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Adi Hasanuddin, for a uh, kind introduction. Uh, I will share my PPT first. I'm sorry, can you uh, see my PPT, Doc? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Adi Arifianto. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Department of Obstetric and Gynecology, Sergito Hospital, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada. Thank you very much for having us today. In this opportunity, I would like to present my current research with the title Oxidative Stress and Storekeep and Recognized HGX Protein to Activate NRF2 ERE Signaling Pathway, thereby inhibiting hepatitis B virus replication. Before I start to explain my research, I will give a brief introduction to the hepatitis B virus. So, hepatitis B virus is hepatinopiridae or hepatinopiridae. 
It is partially circular double-stranded DNA virus consisting of two, three point two syllabate pairs. HPV infects people through blood and body fluid. HPV causes acute and chronic hepatitis, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma. There are approximately 296 million infected people worldwide and 1.5 million infected people in Japan. There are more than 887,000 HBV-related deaths worldwide each year. So HBV has four viral proteins, HBC, HBX, HBS, and DNA polymerase. So this figure shows the HBV life cycle. HBV particles that enter the hepatocyte are unshelled in the cytoplasm. And then the DNA, genomic DNA released from the nucleic acid is translocated into the nucleus. In the nucleus, RCDNA is converted to the CCC DNA, and several types of HBV mRNA are transcribed from the host to the derived RNA polymerase 2 using the CCC DNA as the template. And then the longest 3.5 kilobase pair mRNA is incorporated into the core particle together with the DNA polymerase in the cytoplasm as the pregenomic RNA or the pgRNA. And after the incomplete double-stranded DNA is produced by the action of DNA polymerase reverse transcript phase, the nuclear capsid is wrapped in an envelope and released outside the cell. This is our background study, HVV and redox homeostasis. HVV infection induces oxidative stress and also induces expression of antioxidant enzymes. HVV infection induces disorder of redox homeostasis is associated with the development of hepatic diseases. However, the molecular mechanism of HVV-induced antioxidant response remains unclear. Therefore, in this study, we aim to clarify the molecular mechanism of HVV-induced antioxidant response and to determine the role of antioxidant response in HVV replication. Here, we show the antioxidant response pathway. When the oxidative stress is induced by various stresses in the cells, including viral infection, the transcription factors, such as NRF2, are activated and translocated to the nucleus binds to the ART or antioxidant response element to activate the transcription of antioxidant response gene. In this study, we use ART reporter gene to evaluate the antioxidant response. So at first, to examine whether HPV infection induces antioxidant response, we transcripted the ART luciferase reporter gene in HPV infected HG2 NTCP cell. Luciferous assay show that HBV infection significantly increased the ART luciferase activity. This result suggests that HBV infection induces antioxidant response. Next, uh, to determine which viral proteins are required for HBV induced antioxidant response, we examine the effect of four viral proteins HBX, HBC, LHBS, and HBV polymerase on the ART luciferase activity. So here, figure A shows that HBX specifically enhances the RE luciferase activity. Moreover, in HBV expressing cells, the RE luciferase activity was significantly increased. However, in HBX defective HBV mutant expressing cells or in HBV sa HBX expressing cells, the RE luciferase activity was unchanged compared to the control cell. Then, to determine whether HBX activates antioxidant response, we examine the ARE downstream expression, such as the NPO1, using real-time UPCR. The results show that HBX upregulates the level of NPO1 mRNA. So this result suggests that HBX protein plays an important role in HBV-induced antioxidant response. So next. To clarify the molecular mechanism of HBV, HBX induced AR luciferase activity, we focus on the transcription factor NRF2. NRF2 is crucial regulator of antioxidant defense. In basal condition or in normal condition, TIP1, an inhibitor of NRF2, binds to the NRF2, leading to ubiquitization and degradation of NRF2. Under stress condition, ROS will be produced and disrupt the interaction between TIP1 and NRF2. As a result, NRF2 will be free and translocate to the nucleus, binds to the antioxidant response element to activate the antioxidant response gene. 
So to determine whether NRF2 is involved in HBX induced AR elusive rest activity, we knock down the NRF2 mRNA by using siRNA. As we can see here, knockdown of the NRF2 significantly decreased HBX induced AR elusive rest activity. Moreover, in siRNA resistant NRF2 over expression, restored the decreased AR elusive rest activity. So this result suggests that NRF2 is involved in HBX induced AR elusive rest activity. Next, we ask the question Does HBX activate NRF2 leading to enhancement of AR elusive rest activity? To clarify the role of HBX in the expression of NRF2, we examine the NRF2 protein expression in uh, we examine the NRF2 protein expression and NRF2 nuclear translocation in HBX overexpressing cells. As we can see here, compared to the control cells, the HBX overexpressing cells enhances endogenous NRF2 protein level, but not messenger RNA. In addition, in HBV expressing cells, the endogenous NRF2 protein level was increased. However, in HBX defective HBV murine expressing cells or HBV delta X, HBX, the endogenous NRF2 protein level was unchanged compared to the control cells. Similarly, the NRF2 mRNA doesn't change. This result suggests that HBX enhances NRF2 protein stability in the post translational process. So, next, to determine whether HBX promotes nuclear translocation of NRF2, we perform the subcellular vaccination and indirect immunofluorescence. As we can see here, in the nuclear section, when NRF2 was expressed alone, a little NRF2 was localized in the nucleus. Notably, when HBX co expressed together with NRF2, the nuclear NRF2 was increased. In addition, immunofluorescence assays show that when NRF2 was expressed alone, NRF2 was predominantly localized in the cytoplasm. Meanwhile, when HBX co transfected together with NRF2, NRF2 moved to the nucleus. This result suggests that HBX induces NRF2 activation. So, next to investigate the molecular mechanism of HBX induced NRF2 activation, we hypothesize that HBX interacts with HIP1 and block HIP1 NRF2 interaction. This causes a decrease in the ubiquitin-dependent degradation of NRF2, leading to stabilization of NRF2. To examine the physical interaction between HBX and HIP1, we perform the co-immunoprecipitation assay. As we can see here, HBX, but not HBC, was co-immunoprecipitated with the HIP1. This result suggests that HBX physically interacts with the HIP1. Next, to identify which domain of HIP1 are important for HIP1 HBX interaction, we constructed the HIP1 BPB, IPR, and DGR domain plasmid. It is well known that DGR domain of HIP1 is important for HIP1 and RF2 interaction. The co immunoprecipitation analysis show that DGR domain of HIP1 co immunoprecipitated with HBX. Therefore, this result suggests that HBX interact with KIP1 through DGR domain of KIP1, leading to a decrease in NRF2 KIP1 interaction. Finally, to clarify the role of NRF2 in HBV replication, we examine the effect of overexpression of NRF2 on the HBV promoter species and HBV total RNA and PG RNA level. The promoter reporter assay showed that overexpression of NRF2 strongly inhibits the HBV core promoter driven from HBV genotype A, B, C, and D. On the other hand, NRF2 did not show any effect on the HBX promoter. Overexpression of NRF2 slightly inhibits the pre-S1 and pre-S2S promoter activities. This result suggests that NRF2 strongly inhibits HBV core promoter activity. As we know that HPV core promoter controls the transcription of the pgRNA. Therefore, we examine the effect of overexpression of NRF2 on HPV total RNA and pgRNA level. Real-time PCR assays show that overexpression of NRF2 
strongly inhibit HPV total RNA and tgRNA levels in HPV genotype A, B, C, and D. This result suggests that NRF2 inhibits HPV core promoter activity, leading to down regulation of tgRNA levels. Next, to examine the effect of down regulation of HPV total RNA and tgRNA levels by NRF2, we examine the HGC protein and extracellular HGSAG and HGEAG. As we can see here, immunoblot analysis show that overexpression of NRF2 decreases HBC protein and HBS protein. Moreover, an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays or ELISA show that overexpression of NRF2 decreases extracellular HBSAG and HBEAG. So this result suggests that NRF2 decreases the HBC protein expression and significantly inhibits the amount of extracellular HBSAG and HBEAG. So we found that the HBC core promoter at nucleotide 1667 to 1679 has a similar motif with NRF2 binding motif. Therefore, we ask whether NRF2 binds to the HBC core promoter and inhibits its promoter activity. So next, we perform chromatin immunoprecipitation assay or chip assay to investigate the NRF2 HBC core promoter interaction. The results show that NRF2 significantly binds to the HBC core promoter. This result suggests that NRF2 interacts with HBC core promoter. Next, uh, to verify the nucleotide 1667 to 1679 of HBC core promoter is important. For NRF2 HBC core promoter interaction, we introduce two point mutation, the G. 1669C and A1670C into the HBC core promoter, which are highly conserved common residue in the predicted NRF2 binding motif. Chip assay show that the two-point mutation significantly inhibits interaction between NRF2 HBC core promoter. And then it was reported that another two-point mutation, A1670C and C167 A is important for MAF-F HPV core promoter interaction. However, this two-point mutation doesn't affect the interaction between NRF2 and HPV core promoter. And it is well known that NRF2 heterodimerized with MAF-F to bind to the ARE. Therefore, this result suggests that NRF2 MAF-F binds to the two distinct locations on HPV core promoter. So, in summary, we would like a proposed model like this. Uh, in normal condition or in basal condition, chip 1, an inhibitor of NRF2, will bind to the NRF2, leading to ubiquitization and degradation of NRF2. Upon HPV infection, chip 1 recognizes the HBH and binds to the HBH. As a result, NRF2 will be free and translocate to the nucleus. In the nucleus, NRF2 will bind to the antioxidant response element to activate the transcription of antioxidant response gene. Importantly, we found that NRF2 in the nucleus binds to the HBC, HB, HBC core promoter to inhibit the activities of HBC core promoter, leading to inhibition of HBC replication. So our study suggests that activation of NRF2 are signaling pathway might be a potential strategy against HPV. Uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, Professor Soji and all lab members for supporting my research. And also I would like to thank this research collaborator for giving us uh, valuable reagents. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, applause for Dr. Adi Arifianto. Yeah, now we come to discussion uh, please ask the question directly or you can write at the chat box. Yeah, please. Please state your name and uh, excuse me, uh, my name is Faiz. 
I want to ask Dr. Adi, as your research is talking about oxidative stress and antioxidant response, I want to ask whether there is any impact of oxidative stress in pregnancy. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your nice question. Uh, actually, uh, we we are doing the research about NRF2. So NRF2 is a crucial uh, regulator of antioxidant response, and we found that uh, NRF2 also can suppress the HBC replication. We are doing the research in the basic medical science, uh, but I also uh, read some papers uh, about the effect of oxidative stress itself in the pregnancy. Uh, some researchers say that uh, fetal hypoxia caused by oxidative stress can induce intrauterine growth restriction, preeclampsia, and preterm birth. Oxidative stress uh, caused hypoxia in the first trimester of the pregnancy, and uh, in the prenatal period, fetus is highly vulnerable to oxidative damage. So some researchers found that uh, oxidative stress may enhance the synthesis of pro-inflammatory cytokines that can induce uh, infected preterm birth. So there is uh, so many bad effects of oxidative stress in the pregnancy. Thank you very much for your question. Thank okay. you very much for the clear answer. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Another, Another question, question please? please. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Regina Prof from uh, Sarjita Hospital. Uh, I want to ask to Prof. Iquo, is it enough to give one dose of hepatitis B vaccine and one dose of hepatitis B immunoglobulin in neonates to prevent hepatitis B infection in adult? Thank you. Prof. Iquo. Okay. Uh, so in, in Japan, uh, we used to do the uh, selective vaccination and uh, we chose uh, the uh, mother who carries HIV uh, as antigen and uh, we uh, immunized the uh, mother and, uh, and we uh, introduced the vaccine and HBS uh, immunoglobulin and we nicely uh, brought the uh, mother to uh, child infection and uh, that was very successful. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, in the world, uh, um, many countries, including United States uh, and the European countries, and also China and uh, Korea, uh, they uh, introduced the uh, uh, so, uh, universal vaccination. And uh, 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 several years ago, we also introduced the uh, uh, universal vaccine to uh, uh, all, all the uh, infants. And so uh, now we are uh, expecting that the mother-to-child infection is uh, reducing and uh, decreasing. And, uh, but uh, uh, now we are uh, checking the, uh, the effects of a vaccine to universal vaccine for all uh, the children, and so uh, uh, we hope that uh, universal vaccination uh, reduce the uh, HBV positive rates, uh, not only in child, but also in adults. Thank you. No, Nico. Uh, can you explain uh, what uh, no be done in Japan? And uh, prevention of mother to child transmission or of hepatitis B? Uh, so uh, we, uh, we have a very uh, a good system to uh, uh, examine the uh, HV, uh, the uh, antigens and so in uh, every uh, pregnancy uh, a gynecologist uh, examine the HBV uh, positivity for mothers and then that system really worked and uh, but and and so comparing to other countries Japanese HBV uh, positive rate uh, was really uh, low so uh, so the uh, Japanese doctors uh, uh, believe that uh, this system was very good but uh, 
uh, in the trend, in the world trend, uh, all the countries uh, like uh, uh, United States uh, started uh, an universal vaccination for HVB uh, to infants. So uh, they, uh, uh, we had to uh, change the policy, uh, the governmental policy. And uh, in the beginning, uh, we uh, discussed uh, uh, how much money uh, do we need for universal vaccination. And the uh, government uh, decided to introduce the universal vaccine to all the uh, infants. And, and uh, it, it pro probably, uh, yeah, we uh, uh, expect that uh, this system uh, makes the situation much better. But uh, uh, from the beginning, our country's HPV uh, positive rate was really low. So, uh, but uh, uh, probably the uh, universal vaccine, uh, vaccination uh, makes our situation much better. And uh, another important issue is uh, uh, HPV infection, uh, the tattoo. Tattoo is very important. And the, uh, in, in Japan, the uh, drug abusers, uh, we don't have many drug abusers in Japan, but uh, uh, the uh, young, uh, young people uh, who uh, get tattoo or pierce, and uh, that's uh, one uh, high risk uh, for uh, young people uh, about HPV infection. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Naku. Another question? Ada dari, ya, yeah. okay. Please, one more question. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, my name is Fadur Rahman. I'm from class group 22303. And my question is for Dr. Adi Arkianto. Uh, still related to the previous question asked by my friend. You said that oxidative stress in pregnancy could cause many disorders for pregnant women and fetuses. And your research is about NRF2 as a key role in antioxidant response. And my question is, are there any reports about the role of NRF2 in pregnancy? Thank you. Dr. Adi. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, yes, uh, actually my research found that the antioxidant uh, regulator, the NRF2, can uh, suppress the HPV replication. So as I read some reports, uh, they said that NRF2 elicits potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activities that would be helpful for the elimination of oxidative stress potentiated pregnancy disorder. Uh, for example, uh, some literature mentioned that uh, NRF2 plays a key role in uh, eliminating oxidative stress of the NRF2 AR signaling pathway in the preeclampsia condition. And some people later also say that NRF2 is very sensitive to maternal immune status and is responsible for fetal growth and survival through maintaining fetal desirable placental environment. Uh, in conclusion, the uh, strong maternal uterine antioxidant environment could prevent pregnancy disorder and abnormal birth outcomes and could also prevent other complications later in life which might initiate from embryonic stages. So NRF2, NRF2 is very uh, beneficial in the pregnancy. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank uh, you, Dr. Still, still one, one question? One question. Yes, please. I saw, I, I saw a question from chat room. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prof. Iqwo, Dr. Adi, and also Dr. My question is for Dr. Adi. Uh, it's interesting to understand about NRF2 and how can we get NRF2? Is there any supplementation or uh, natural food that contain NRF2? Thank you. Ah, thank you very much for the nice question. Yes, uh, so NRF2 actually can be found in the nature, such as in the fruits and vegetables, uh, such as the broccoli and then garlic, onions, uh, apples, berry, dark chocolate, curcumin, 
it can be found uh, and arrested in that uh, some uh, some kind of fruit and food. So I found that uh, some paper already found that the compound it's called the flavonoid. Flavonoid is uh, one of the polyphenol group, and it can uh, the flavonoids are well recognized as natural compounds of NRF2, but limited studies have been documented on the polyphenol supplementation during pregnancy and its out outcome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, still many discussion that we want to continue, but uh, because of time, I think we, we enough this discussion. And can I conclude the, the lecture today that uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Iquo, have uh, a new light for us about the NRTX, PRTX1, and also exhaust uh, pipe in the uh, has host defense mechanism in HPV infection. And also Dr. Mysuri Khalid uh, have uh, uh, our role in preventing the mother to child transmission uh, of HPV. And the next uh, step uh, of, the, of the government. And Dr. Adi uh, enlightened us with the role of the antioxidant in the uh, in the development and management of uh, HPV infection. Uh, I uh, can we conclude uh, this meeting? Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Iquo. Terima kasih, uh, Dr. Maisuri Khalid. Sudah. Uh, banyak memberikan sesuatu buat residen kita dan kita semuanya saya juga ya kemudian dokter Adi dari Jepang uh, Adi Katu Mas terima kasih dokter Maisuri Khalid ya yeah. uh, we hope that uh, someday you visit us again Prof Iko uh, in Yogyakarta ya yeah. uh, oke okay. uh, Terima Thank kasih. Saya kembalikan ke. Ya. Terima kasih. Ya, terima kasih. Terima kasih uh, kembalikan ke pembaca acara. Silakan. Ya, thank you very much, Dr. Asanuddin, and please give a warm round of applause for this guest lecture session. And I would like to express all of uh, my gratitude for the lecturers that happened to join us today, Prof. Iquo and also Dr. Maisuri dan juga Dr. Adi Arfianto and also for Dr. Asanuddin for guiding us to, uh, through whole session. Uh, and we already in our last session which is uh, closing and uh, I hope we can have another guest lecture maybe in the next semester and we will be waiting for Dr. Adi to come back and implement the research. And uh, me, my name is Reska Khalifa as MC. Today I will uh, say thank you and apologize if, the, if there is any mistakes that uh, been done in this uh, occasion. And we will see you next time in another event. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.